Hey everyone, welcome to the second video for chapter 33. Uh, for this one, we're going to be talking about European imperialism. So the previous video established that the industrial, industrialized world had numerous motives for conquering the rest of the world and significant advantages that allowed them to do so. This video, we're going to get into the different regions conquered by European nations, starting with the country that did the most conquering, Great Britain. Now, the British Empire in India uh, is where we're going to be uh, looking at first. And and British rule in India started in a much less direct fashion than in other parts of the world. It didn't actually begin with the British Army, but rather with the British East India Company. Um, I'll come back to this map in a second. Okay, let me just kind of set the stage here. So the Mughal Empire, right? That was that large Muslim empire that had kind of, you know, centralized and consolidated power in India throughout the uh, 1600s. By the early 1700s, that was in serious decline. Uh, political power in India was very splintered. Um, the British East India Company took advantage of this lack of strong leadership uh, by expanding its power in India. Right, so you see in 1767, you can see you know the different trading outposts along the coast with the date of acquisition. And then the blue area were areas where they were starting to really kind of make inroads and, and take over. Um, they did use British troops for this, but they also employed a large amount of Indian troops called sepoys. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, 1805, right? You can see India, uh, the darker blue areas that were directly under the control. So they had pretty much the entire Ganges plain through here, all right, into the Bay of Bengal. Uh, they also had the small island of Ceylon, which today is known as Sri Lanka. Um, but then by 1858, you know that there's a very, very big difference, okay, where, you know, it's one, it shows that it's under direct control of the British Empire, and then all of these go from allied states to dependent states. Uh, what happened there was that the British uh, took a much more direct control with it, and this was due to the Sepoy Rebellion. Now, as I said, Sepoys were Indians that worked for the British East India Company, right, that were employed by them. And the British for many years had been very dismissive of Indian cultural traditions the way they are of any culture that's not British. But they made a grave mistake with the sepoys. New rifle cartridges, uh, they used animal fat to seal them. And then you had to bite off the end of the cartridge in order to get to the bullets. Uh, this was a problem for Indians because Hindus objected that the fat might be from cows and Muslims objected that they might be from pigs. And so they found this to be very cultural offensive. Now, this seemingly minor policy, uh, it turned out to be the straw that broke the camel's back. And in 1857, the sepoys staged a mutiny and killed their British officers. This relatively local and small outbreak grew into a large scale rebellion and led to horrible massacres on both sides. You know, the Indians went into uh, British uh you know, the uh, military barracks where it wasn't just the officers or the soldiers, it was also their wives and their children and they would slaughter them. And then when the British showed up and they sent all the reinforcements, they were just as brutal in putting them down. Um, and, you know, the British crown eventually said enough of this. And so they sent, uh, you know, everything they had with the British army and they crushed the rebellion. Um, this chaotic episode, it led the British government to say that we need to take a much more direct control of India, leading to British imperial rule. So, as you can see here in 1858, right afterwards, Britain extended rule over the entire subcontinent, and a royal viceroy was sent to direct represent uh, to be a direct representative of the crown. They made significant economic changes, uh, such as forcing India to focus on cash crops like tea and cotton and opium, uh, as well as making huge improvements to the transportation system in India. You know, Indian railroads became uh, a you know kind of a very big part of their um, culture and the, and their civil at that point. Uh, they also made significant cultural changes. Now, Britain never pushed Christianity too much, but they absolutely made English culture the dominant culture. And an awful lot of Indian elites tried to emulate this. Kind of a perfect example of it. You see a young British man from the early 20th century, and he's dressed in his three-piece suit, and you know he was actually a lawyer, and you'll be kind of... Uh, you know, fascinated to know that this uh, individual is Gandhi as a young man. So the more kind of famous depiction of Gandhi in his traditional Hindu robes and with a bald head, that was very, very different from the Gandhi of a young man when he looked at himself as being a part of the British Empire. You know, and he was trained in Oxford to be a lawyer. And as I said, wore the suit the same as any British person walking around in London. So they really looked at that as being a way to be a part of the empire. Uh, English schools became the top school. 
rules, English customs and dress were encouraged, right? You see here uh, Sikh uh, individuals in India kind of participating on, on the same polo team as uh, English uh, individuals in India at that time. Um, they also banned certain Hindu customs, although this wasn't always a bad thing. Um, they got rid of the, uh, that old custom of sati, which was where the wives, uh, the widows, would then jump into the fire as uh, their husband's body was being cremated. Uh, so that was a good thing that women weren't throwing themselves into flames. And they also raised the minimum age uh, for girls to marry. So it wasn't all evil. Now, Central Asia and Southeast Asia, Britain had a firm hold on the Indian subcontinent, but it ran into more competition in neighboring lands. Uh, the weakening of the Ottoman Empire and also the weakening of the Qing Dynasty made Central Asia and, and Southeast Asia very open for newcomers. Britain competed with Russia for control in Central Asia in what became known as the Great Game. Now, the Great Game refers to a long period of territorial competition, political tension between Russia and Britain, and it was mostly over Central Asia. Right? You're talking about your Stan countries, uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan. Now, all of these ones up here, down to Afghanistan, were eventually conquered by the Russian Empire, and they would even be part of the Soviet Union later. Afghanistan was the tricky one, though, and this is really where an awful lot of the tension between the two came. Here you have the Afghan in the middle of the Russian bear and the English lion. Um, and the British really tried to make significant inroads into it, but they were unable to. Uh, also, the Soviet Union, we'll talk about this later in 1979 when they tried to invade Afghanistan. That would be very difficult for them. It'd be kind of Both of those gave rise to uh, the image of Afghanistan as being the boneyard of empires, right? and even of the United States in the 21st century. But in any event, all of this was viewed as, as, as a setup for an eventual conflict for the Indian subcontinent. Um, you know, And then uh, eventually... Uh, Britain and Russia will go to war. Now, World War I and the downfall of the Russian Empire prevented this from happening. Uh, so, you know, the Great Game never really culminated in what everybody envisioned. Southeast Asia was also a site for competition among European nations. Now, this region uh, had been contested back in the 15 and 1600s for control of the spice trade, right? First by the Portuguese and by the Dutch. And now other countries were moving in to take more direct imperial rule, such as British colonies in Southeast Asia. Uh, British control in Southeast Asia was meant to mostly facilitate trade, um, you know, between India and China. In 1824, a British government official actually founded the port city of Singapore. Um, didn't mean to do that, so just hold off on that for a sec. And it quickly became a dominant trade site in the region. And the British weren't the only ones. Uh, you know, you have uh, French Indochina. Um, French Indochina was created in the late 1800s, and it included modern-day Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. All right, so here's your map of Southeast Asia. Uh, here's Singapore, as I said. So kind of the orange ones are British. You've got Burma, uh, would eventually be Malaysia, right? Where Singapore's in Malaysia. You see the Dutch, they still have an awful lot here, right? Batavia, that was a big Dutch, uh, trading outpost going back to the 1600s. So you have Dutch New Guinea. You have the Portuguese, just a couple of little spots that they're still involved with. And then you have French Indochina here, Saigon, which, uh, it's a large city in Vietnam today. Right. So um, France introduced European schools the same way that the British did in India, uh, but they took a much more kind of direct uh, or I should say forceful encouragement of religion, uh, namely Catholicism. It's one of the reasons why Catholicism is still uh, fairly widespread in, in uh, Vietnam today. Um, you know, and so by the end of 19th century, uh, Siam, right, you see this one uh, here in what is modern day Thailand, was the only area in Southeast Asia not under European control. Now, in the Pacific, you know, as we'll discuss in the next video, Africa was the main focus for European imperialism, but the Pacific Ocean wasn't completely overlooked by them. Imperialism in this part of the globe took, took two main forms, settler colonies or bases of operations for trade. First, let's look at settler colonies. And this, we're talking really about Australia and New Zealand. Now, after uh, Captain James Cook's voyages to Australia in the 1770s, British interest in the large island grew. Um, they took an interesting approach into how they settled Australia. They sent large numbers of convicted settlers first as criminals. Here you see an awful lot of convicts being uh, kind of um, offloaded in Botany Bay. 
Uh, the identity of Australia as a huge prison colony, though, is a bit over-exaggerated. Um, voluntary migrants, you know, they outnumbered the convicts by the 1830s. And then the discovery of gold in Australia in 1851 brought a huge influx of European uh, in migration. Um, now, this, you know, European migration didn't go over very well with the indigenous populations. Much like the Americas, disease brought by the Europeans devastated the aborigines of Australia. And the British used brutal tactics to take land away from them. And sometimes, excuse me, this led to actual warfare, you know, whether it was between the British and the Aborigines or between the British and the natives of New Zealand, the Maori. Um, you know, the, and the Maori especially gave very, very fierce resistance to them. But the British, you know, being the industrialized power, they were able to overtake them. And the Maori were forced into very poor rural communities. So those are settler colonies. You also have commercial bases. You know, up until the late 19th century, European involvement in Polynesia and Oceania was mostly about trade or missionary work. The Pacific Islands were just too small and remote for large-scale European settlement like we saw in Australia and New Zealand. This change in the late 1800s, when nationalism drove imperial expansion to every corner on the earth, right? France and England and Germany, they were all in competition for each other of who could take over more land. Didn't matter if it was a tiny little island in the Pacific. Europeans also looked for ports for steamships making voyages across the Pacific. And these Pacific islands just weren't about strategy. There was also wealth from resources such as sugar plantations in Hawaii and Fiji, uh, vegetable oil from Samoa. You know, the Berlin Conference that we're going to talk about in the next video when it divided up Africa, it wasn't just about Africa. Europeans divided up the Pacific as well. You can see by the map here. Let me move me. Uh, the only one that wasn't uh, under some type of foreign rule was the Kingdom of Tonga. The rest of them, you see British, obviously they got the big ones of Australia and New Zealand. You see French, you see Dutch, and you see America in here as well. American Samoa, and you got Hawaii, Midway, okay, they're up there as well. So all of these little islands, they got gobbled up too. All right, so that we touched on a couple of different areas. And then in the next one, uh, we'll talk about kind of the big focus for European imperialism with Africa.